Hi guys and welcome back to another episode of Autism Journeys. It's really hard to believe that we're actually on our fifth show already. Our two guests tonight are Paul Isaacs, who is an autism advocate, speaker, trainer and author, and Valerie Sheehan, who is an early intervention therapist and, and the author of Tony the Turtle books. Uh, so I'd like to welcome our first guest, Paul Isaacs. Good evening, Paul. Good evening. Paul, thank you so much for coming on the show this evening. We're absolutely delighted to have you on here. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, Paul, can I ask you a couple of questions? I suppose the first being, I know, I know that you're, you're an autistic trainer, a speaker, a consultant and a blogger. And I know that you've also co-authored several books. I know that you've co-authored Life, on the, uh, Life Through a Kaleidoscope and Living Through the Haze. Um, you've huge, huge experience in the, the, the field of autism. Um, I suppose I want our listeners to know, first of all, that you are, in fact, our very first guest that has a diagnosis of autism. Um, can I ask you, Paul, at what age were you diagnosed with autism? Uh, I was formally diagnosed with autism at, at the age of, of 24, so that was in 2010. So I didn't have, obviously, a formal diagnosis, so that meant I went through mainstream education uh, and had no uh, additional support, no sort of formal recognition of special educational needs, uh, no psychologists, psychiatrists um, who specialise in autism. Um, so it was very much uh, a learning curve uh, as I went along. Um, so I was born in 1986. Um, I was a premature baby. Um, I was also difficult as a birth. Uh, my mum had, or both of us had, I suppose, more accurately, a placental abruption. So that's to do with oxygen deprivation. Yeah. It was I was born through an emergency cesarean section, um, and obviously I was underdeveloped, uh, had brain injury as a part of my autism. So um, I had a lot of obvious developmental delays, um, speech and language, motor coordination. Uh, I was severely autistic um, in terms of presentation in my infancy and I didn't gain functional speech until about the ages of seven or eight and it was expressively of a three-year-old. Um, so it wasn't uh, a trajectory in terms of Asperger's syndrome where I was, I was speaking um, yeah. at an early age. I actually had many uh, different blockages um, in terms of visual perception, which I know you're going to go on to in a minute, and language processing. So uh, my mum initially thought I was deaf and blind. Okay. Um, physically, so organically, you know, my eyes and ears were damaged. Of course, it was to do with how my brain was, or more accurately, wasn't perceiving um, visual and auditory information. Okay. So that gives you a bit of background on my development. <laughs> okay. Can I ask you, Paul, um, are you, you just said there that initially people thought that perhaps you were presenting as somebody that was blind and deaf. Um, what kind of stuff did you have to go through? What kind of assessments? Was there any... I, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that when you were presenting so profoundly as a young person that you were 24 before you required um, your formal diagnosis. Was there any other other assessments or any other checklists that were were ticked off before ever this came about? Um, yeah, I mean, there's initially, um, you know, um, sort of um, judgments made. So in terms of when I went to preschool, play school, that was before primary school, um, one of the teachers thought uh, I had an attachment disorder um, because of the behaviours I was displaying. Okay. Um, so she went down the road of assuming that um, my mother was somehow to blame um, for my behaviour. So if you look at that from obviously a surface perspective, if a child is withdrawn or if a child is not behaving like other children... Um, and there's no diagnosis, um, 
you can see why someone could uh, leap to that conclusion yeah. that there's an attachment issue or there's potential abuse going on at home, which there wasn't. Yeah. Um, however, it's ironic that in the 1950s and the 1960s, um, autism was thought to be... The refrigeration mother theory. Yeah, uh, refrigerator mothers, a form of attachment disorder. or And then in the 60s, people thought it was, ch- it was a form of psychosis. And then in the 70s and 80s, a form of mental retardation. Yeah. And then Asperger's came into the forefront in 94. Yeah. Um, with the diagnostic manual listing it as a separate syndrome. And now it's a lot to do with sensory. So there's a lot of progress in what people thought autism wasn't. Um, I had an uh, educational psychologist see me in 1993. Um, nothing really came of that. Okay. Went to CAMS in 1996 with clinical depression, um, childhood depression, but yeah. nothing came of that either. In fact, when I read my old notes um, from the old CAMS meetings, because I requested to have my yeah. medical documents a few years ago, Again, they were sort of going down the attachment disorder route. Um, they were thinking that the reason why I was behaving quote unquote abnormally was because of some sort of environmental issue. Okay. So, yeah, a lot of um, different sort of perceptions and I suppose potential diagnoses were made before I was formally diagnosed with autism. Yeah, I suppose I, I'm listening, Paul, and I feel aghast. I'm listening and I'm flabbergasted at the thoughts that that all of these these theories and all of these ideas and attachment disorders and refrigeration mother immediately popped to mind in my head when you were speaking. Um, all these these theories that have been since completely and utterly um, realised that they're not right, uh, and now suddenly, like we're still looking at those kind of those kind of attitudes in the in the noughties and it, like in the nineties and in the noughties. I'm just I I I suppose I'm flabbergasted, but I'm st- I, I'm very very pleased to see that that today that you've had a formal diagnosis and that life is very very good and that it's very positive and that you've achieved so so much in, as such a young man. Do you know? Um, can I ask you, Paul, with regards to, to your sensory processing difficulties and obviously it's a language processing difficulties, really, um, are there any strategies that you found um, were beneficial for you growing up without a diagnosis that you perhaps think other people might benefit from hearing? Um, I suppose, yeah, just as a sort of disclaimer, this is obviously going to be uh, from from a personal... Oh, absolutely. I, I, oh, absolutely. There's, this is your opinion and this is something that worked for you that, it, that obviously it is, it is just you that it worked for, but I suppose it would be good for our listeners to hear. Oh, um, certainly, yeah. So uh, with the, the sort of face blindness and um, the, the visual perceptual issues, of course, um, if someone's face blind within their autism profile, they may struggle with bonding because um, facial recognition is very important um, in terms of bonding. So you may um, not recognise or perceive people that you've known for a long time for association. So the way in which I recognise people is their voice and patterns of movement, the way they move, the way they move their body, uh, the way their gait um, and how they talk. So that was very important to me in terms of uh, gauging um, someone through that sort of association. Okay. That was sort of kinesthetic, tactile, okay. auditory, I suppose. Um, when I was very young and we're going on to the visual perceptual disorders, um, because I didn't see with meaning, and that's why I appeared to be blind, yeah. Um, so my eyes work, but my perception of what was going on and what was seen was firstly fragmented and secondly meaningless in terms of vision alone. So I had to touch, sniff, tap, rub and sculpt okay. my way through the world. So, so in other upon... words, I was externalising to internalise. Yeah. So my father was faith not in the sense of the word faith, but I used to sculpt his face 
and that would give me the association that that was my father. Um, my mother was hair, because I was inherited her thick, curly hair, so I would gain association through tactile association because the visual perceptual disorders were so severe. That was the only way I was going to gain some association in terms of recognition and perception. So it's almost like a trade-off. If, if part of my brain isn't processing visuals properly, then I was using other um, sensory Senses. systems yeah. to actually get a sense of bonding and a sense of connection. Okay, okay. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm actually fascinated. I suppose I'm going to move on, Paul, to the um, agnosia that you were talking about. I know you mentioned three words to me. You, you mentioned simult agnosia, proto agnosia, and semantic agnosia. Now, correct me if I'm wrong um, in my pronunciations. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? A, a little bit a, in a little bit more detail, I suppose. That simult yeah. being object yeah. and proto. I mean, I've touched upon. Uh, prosopagnosia yeah. um, and it has a high prevalence a high overlap um, with autism agnosia means a perceptual loss so as you've gathered the, 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 the auditory or visual or any other organ uh, sensory organs are working but the way in which the information is being t interpreted isn't hence the word agnosia, yeah. which is loss of knowledge. Um, so it's not a loss in cognitive skills, it's a perceptual loss. So people can acquire it, for example. Someone could hit their head one day and, you know, so severely that they acquire face blindness, for example. They, they don't recognise people um, by their faces. I suppose the difference with me is that I don't know a life of, knowing what faces look like so that's a different set of issues yeah um so with face blindness it it's about association so some people um may recognize people by a familiar piece of clothing or multiple pieces of clothing such as having their hair in a certain way or they wear a certain type of glasses with a certain type of frame or they walk around with a certain type of handbag or a certain pair of earrings but if any of those little um, pieces of information are lost or changed, um, they may not associate it as being the same person. With me, um, if, if someone had a cold and their voice changed or they'd hurt their foot or their leg and their gait changed, then I could quite easily walk past them like two ships in the night. Yeah, so it, it sounds kind of confusing almost, yeah. So some people that will be verbal... Like, if you think of a school setting, if someone's got a lanyard, and that gives context. So, who this person is, and how that association works with the other person. Like, it's Mrs. Bates, who's the science teacher, or is it, it, it's Mr. Colony, Colony, who happens to be the PE teacher. You know, it gives very contextual information yeah. about who that person is and what that person means in relation to the other person. Yeah. So that just gives you a few examples of how face blindness can potentially work. It sounds it sounds like it can be very confusing and obviously very problematic as you say if something if something goes wrong if somebody loses it loses the ability to walk or if somebody if somebody even changes their their clothes and decides to to change style in their fashion sense or do you know it sounds it sounds like it can be quite tough but it sounds like you're you've managed to figure out great strategies around how to associate people in different ways do you know um, yes, that's correct. Um, tinted lenses help. Okay. Um, so I wear tinted lenses, and that brings binds uh, my visual world together. And I was diagnosed with uh, visual perceptual disorders in 2012. Um, so you know, two years after my autism diagnosis. Yeah. So the tinted lenses just bind visual information together, so I can pick it up quick enough be able to associate it with something rather than being lost in it. Fabulous, fabulous. It's great to have a, a tool like that. Um, Paul, what about this, this Simult, Simult, is it, Agnosia? Simult Agnosia, 
yeah, object blindness is to do with, um, you know, your you can you can only focus on one piece of visual information at a time. You cannot bind it together. So that can affect context. That can affect learning. That can affect um, reading, writing. So I've got dyslexia as well and dyscalculia. So visual fragmentation can be potentially heaven and hell. In some ways, I, when I was younger, I was fixated and got chemical highs from, you know, flushing toilets and looking at the, at the water being flushed over and over again, um, particularly on a day, a sunny day, when the, the, the light hit the water, I'd just be enraptured and engulfed in this feeling that I got from seeing pieces of things um, and never holes. So people would be in bits. Um, objects would be in bits, everything would be in bits, and nothing ever seemed to be able to be in a hole okay. that was tangible. So that obviously affected for me learning, in particular visual learning. Visual verbal learning was very difficult um, in my mainstream years. So um, that that was very difficult, but then the way in which I really um, look at my school years uh, in terms of, you know, what, what do I, what am I thankful for? In some ways, um, I am thankful for being bullied. I am thankful for people subjecting me to ridicule, as odd as that sounds, um, because it gave me a template of how not to treat people. Good. It gave me an idea of human interaction, even though it wasn't positive. Um, even though I wasn't quote-unquote protected, um, I was able to learn and adapt and actually defend myself um, from different things, physical, emotional abuse, whatever you want to call it. And I wouldn't have had it any other way because even though I wasn't formally diagnosed, obviously during those mainstream years, um, I was nevertheless treated as a person, um, not necessarily as everything being about my autism. So, you know, it was a sink or swim scenario, okay. and I chose to swim, and that is what I benefit from actually being in difficult situations. There's always a positive I like that we, we have that um, methodology in our home as well as to look for the positive and everything, look for the, the silver lining. Um, and I suppose it's very, very powerful words when you hear somebody saying that they, they're they glad in a way that they were bullied because they learned from it and that they, that they were able to put a positive spin on it. And not many people are able to do that. And it's 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 good to yeah. hear, do you know? It is good to hear. The other thing I really liked there, Paul, was a, your description of... A, a, of of your focusing on visual stuff, um, uh, I suppose that that's it's it's great to have insight into a child looking at something and becoming so focused on visually on it uh, that they actually lose the the understanding of their surroundings. And even if somebody doesn't present with this agnosia, um, it sounds like it might fit a lot of kids that like a lot of uh, children with autism tend to be very very focused visually on like we'd say I know I'm for want of a better example focused on the wheels turning or do you know it, it you, you you just explain that very 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 well and very powerfully to us do you know um, it's good to have that kind of insight into to our kids and um, Paul can I can I go on a different route for a minute and just ask you about your experience as a speaker I know that you're you're a speaker and that you're a trainer and that you're a consultant these days in the autism world um, I suppose just have you had any any feedback on on that aspect in your life or do you have any any stuff that you'd like to tell us about with regards to that aspect in your life I suppose with, with, with the autism work um, that you mentioned you know I, I, in terms of the work I do, um, I try and live a very balanced life. So with, with my autism work, obviously I'm talking about autism with you tonight, I, I try and balance my work out accordingly, and that's through you know pursuing interests, meeting up with friends, uh, not, not making my life 
all about one thing, but scattering and peppering it with different things. So, for example, I like to I like to write poetry. Um, I like to do art. I like to um, create, you know, stuff. Creativity has probably saved me more than anything else. And the pro and the and the thing about creativity with me is that it's unconscious creativity so i don't know what i'm going to create until it's finished okay i don't know what i'm going to write and or what it's going to look like or what it's going to sound like until it's finished so i work on an unconscious level with everything and what i struggle with the most is conscious thoughts conscious jabbing thoughts or thoughts that um, propel me into conscious thinking so a lot of what i do a lot of the depth and interest that comes from me comes from just writing something and then reading it back and then understanding about myself or doing a piece of art that is introspective and emotional and shows um, awareness. So Donna Williams, a famous autistic author, writer, painter, blogger, you name it, (laughs) Um, uh, she talks about the system of sensing which babies have and babies pick up all this information but don't necessarily interpret it. So what happens with me is I pick up all this information, however jolting or fragmented or um, distorted it is, and then from a subconscious level, I can write or create art or create, write a book, and it's introspective. So what so I mean by process. that is when I read it back or look at it, I understand a bit more about myself. So it's almost like having a chat with yourself and understanding your innermost thoughts through the act of being. I struggle with the act of doing. I'm very much a beer, not a doer. Do you know, Paul, I'm listening there to you. I could listen to you all day, actually. I, I, I'm so, so interested. Um, uh, but I know we're running out of time, so I'm, I, I suppose I just want to finish up on this point. I love the way that you say that you're not just autism. In, in a nutshell, that you're not just autism, that you are, in fact, a poet, that you're an artist, that you're creative, that you're, you, even when you do have conscious thought, that you're, you use... You use that to focus differently and to to become introspective and to learn about yourself. Um, I find, listening to you, I find you're inspirational, Paul. I absolutely think that you're inspirational and that you were put on this earth to change it up and to raise awareness and to make sure that everyone else's path behind you is going to be an easier path to travel. Um, Paul, listen, thank you so, so much for coming on this evening. You've been an absolute pleasure to listen to and to speak to this evening. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. It's been lovely to speak to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Now, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Valerie Sheehan to the show, the author of the Tony the Turtle books. Uh, Valerie, thanks so much for agreeing to come on the, the show with us tonight. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you for having me. Uh, Valerie, we may as well get right started into it. Uh, my first question for you is, what experience do you have in the field of autism? Um, I have been working as a home tutor for 12 years. Um, I worked as a SNA for five years in Co Foundation. Um, and while working there, I went back to college. And I did a Montessori degree, and this sparked my interest in autism. So once I got my degree, I decided to go out for a year as a tutor, and here I am 12 years later. Fantastic. So, yes. uh, can I ask you, Valerie, have you worked with many children on the autism spectrum over the years, or have you had more, a, a smaller number of more regular children? Um, I've worked with two to three children every year. Fabulous. For the, for the 12 years. Fabulous. So. And with a, a varying um, level of ability or? Um, all different levels of ability, um, but all early intervention. All the kids I've worked with have been under six. Now, Val, can I ask you, I know I met you many, many years ago and you were absolutely fabulous in your role as a home tutor. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, what was your motivation to, to veer off and write some books for children with autism? Um, because I didn't think there was enough resources available for families okay. and spending 20 hours a week with family you get to know them really well you become part of the furniture um, so I just wanted to find a way to help not only the family I was with but other families as well that makes absolute yeah. sense I suppose to generalise those resources and make yeah. them available to everybody yeah 
Yeah. I remember speaking to a parent one time and I was recommending books for her to read in the evening. Okay. And she said to me, by the time her son actually, by the time he actually goes to sleep, reading about autism is the last thing she wants to do. Okay. Which I totally understood, but I never saw it from that point of view. Yeah. So I wanted to do a storybook that would help both parents and children at the same time take 10 minutes when you're putting your child to bed and then you can sit down and relax and feel you've still learned something. Yeah. No, they're absolutely fabulous. What amount of research have you done, Val, with regards to, to writing these books and figuring out what suits the kids best and parents best? Um, well, that's funny, actually, because I never realised it was research as it was happening. Okay. It all happened very organically because it was all the activities I was doing with the child over the year. Okay. So with every kid, uh, different things worked, but I used a lot of the common traits to okay. create the books then okay. for what worked. A lot of common strategies, I suppose. Yeah, there's nothing in the books that I haven't tried myself and it hasn't worked. I definitely note that the illustrations used, are re like they really relay Tony's feelings and emotions uh, and I can really see a definite um, progression throughout the books from from start to finish, from number one to number six. I think that they, they're very clear it's very easy for children of all levels to see whether a person, whether Tony is sad or happy or yeah. frustrated or whatever. I think that they're a fantastic resource to to generalise, to use generally with the, the general autistic populace of kids, if yes. that makes sense. Yeah. Can I ask you, Val, I know that there is a very personal reason for your, your, your choice of the name that you gave Tony. Uh, can I ask you a little bit about that? You can, of course. Um, well... The character it was a turtle. I want, always wanted a turtle because I wanted to show the significance of coming in and out of your shell. Yeah. Because when children with autism are overwhelmed, they can go into their shell. Yeah. You know, so sometimes you want to bring them out of their shell, but you want to allow time that they can go in the shell, yeah. like all of us. Um, so Tony was my late dad's name. Okay. Um, so that, that was a given, that he was going to be Tony the turtle. Okay. Um, so... Did your dad um, did your dad have the opportunity to see any of these, he these did. books before he oh, passed? He, he was my biggest fan and my biggest critic, actually. So he changed a few lines in the first three stories. Oh, fab. <laughs> he did, yeah. Fab. Um, so he got to see the first three published. Um, he passed away three weeks after. Okay. So, so, so it, it was great. it was very poignant, but yeah. very wonderful moment. It keeps him with me. Good. So it's keeps great. him alive. Keeps Good. him alive. Yeah. Good. I actually learned a lot from my dad, Tony. He worked with adults. On the autism spectrum. Oh, fab. So, yeah, he knew what he was talking about. So he was he was one of the topmost critics of the book because he knew exactly, exactly. what would suit exactly. or what wouldn't suit. Exactly, yeah. Now, I know, Val, that you, there's two volumes of uh, your books out at present. Um, the first including Tony Goes Swimming, Tony Goes Shopping, and Tony Tries New Food. And the second including Tony Goes to a Party, Tony Goes to the Playground, and Tony Goes in the Car. Um, I suppose I actually really, really like... This series of books, I find that they're very, very good for highlighting areas of difficulty right across the autism spectrum and indeed just across across childhood in general, I suppose. Um, Thank you. I'm looking there, like I, there's one one page actually that I, that kind of jumped out at me um, when I was reading through them. Um, it's, it's a line from Tony Goes to a Party. Uh, it's the candles are lit. It's time for some cake. Tony goes into his shell for a quiet break. He stays in there while they sing the song. He comes out when it's done. It doesn't take long. I absolutely love it. I love the fact that it's it's allowing it like it kind of highlights that it's okay for the child yeah. to, to 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 retreat and to go into a yeah. shell, and that when that kind of sensory stuff is over with, yeah. that he can come back out exactly. again. Exactly. That's inspired by a little boy I worked with, because he hated. At school, we used to go to preschool. If anyone sang happy birthday, we'd leave the room. You know, yeah. and there was no problem with it. Yeah. But it was just, he just didn't like the singing. Came straight back in for cake and everything, but he just didn't like the yeah. singing. And I suppose, no. if, if nothing else as well, Val, not only does it give people knowledge about it, not, not only does it highlight, I suppose, that a child can have a sensory issue around noise and all that mm. kind of a crack, but actually it normalises the fact that the child might need to take some time out and yeah. that it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal at all. Know? And like, that's the whole idea behind Tony especially if they're reading them in schools, that, oh, Tony does it. So it's not, it's not a big deal. Exactly. He just sees it things differently. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, I actually, I really, yeah. really like the way that everything is just so clear cut and that yeah. there, is no, there is no room for judging a child based on something that they have no choice but exactly. To, exactly. to do, do you know? Val, who is your target audience for these books? Um, like I mentioned earlier, it was 
um, the books are written for parents. Okay. That's where the whole idea came from, was a resource for parents, okay. but written as a children's book. Okay. So I want parents to learn from them. Every sentence in the book has a message or a lesson or a helpful tip. That's the plan. Right. Can, <laughs> so, you, can you highlight one of those for me? Um, okay, so in Tony Goes Swimming, um, so they're going home after the swimming. So it says, now they're all packed up in the car. Mum says, Tony, you are a star. Don't say that, Mum. It's a lie. I don't live up in the sky. Fab. So that, again, now would be showing parents about the literal thinking. You know he doesn't live up in the sky. Yeah. So, whereas, you know, you could say a comment so easily, like, you know, it's easy as a piece of cake. Yeah. What does a piece of cake cake? mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, so things like that. Yeah. Pull up your socks, those kind of idioms. Yeah. What do you mean, pull up my socks? Yeah, not wearing any socks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Val, I know that you've had another great accolade around these books. Yeah. I know that you were on the infamous Late Late Toy Show um, two years ago, is that right? Two years ago, yeah, that was a, that was a great um, accolade, like you put. Um, I was thrilled. I got an email the day before, and now I had hounded them, to be fair, but I had got an email to say it had, the books had been chosen for the show, but due to it being live TV, there was no guarantee. Okay. So I didn't want to make a big fuss then because there was no guarantee. Okay. So just um, myself and my best friend and family, we watched it and okay. jumped around. Then and, we, and sure they came enough, on, they yeah. came on the screen. Sure enough. <laughs> um, and another thing, actually, I want to ask you about is I know that you're you're um, a big fan of Temple Grandin. I know that you. I met you recently at yes, the Temple yes. Grandin talk amazing. on the Monday evening, um, and I believe that you actually received an email I from did. her. Something that most people would love yeah. to get. I think that's my biggest highlight since I started this journey. Okay. Um, so I got the books into her hands through uh, six degrees of separation, really. Okay. Someone who knew someone who knew someone who lived in Colorado who got them to her. Uh, and she just sent me an email, and the one line said, uh, Dear Valerie, uh, I believe your books will help children on the autism spectrum. Temple Grandin. That's oh, wow. It. Yeah. Well, so, so in very typical Temple just, Grandin yeah, style. one sentence, but it was enough for me. Fabulous. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> Moving forward, Val, where do you see this going? Do you have any plans for any new books in the in the, in the, the pipeline? Or I do. I have um, three more books coming out later this year. Fabulous. Yeah, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, Tony uses the toilet. Tony gets his hair cut and Tony starts school. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so there are three, three good ones now. I'm, I'm really thrilled with them. Yeah, really good ones, I suppose, yeah. to help the, with those very tricky sensory times exactly. and those, those kind of, I suppose, those transitionary periods and yeah. all that. And if our Irish listeners did want to purchase these books, Val, where would they go to or how would they access it? Um, so the books are all available on my website, um, TonyTheTurtle.com. Okay. Um, they're also available actually in Washstones in Cork City and Liam Russell's. Great. Um, and I think they're in, in Super Value in Cove Great. as well. This, so you've lots of, they, people yeah, have lots sorry, of Sorry, I'm trying to think there's a few different places. People yeah. living in Cork might access access them Easier. in the shop yes. or whatever, but people that are living up the country or whatever, it's possible it's to. It's the website. Exactly. And yeah. tell me that website again. It's uh, TonyTheTurtle.com. Okay. Yeah. And now you did mention to me before, uh, before we spoke about... Um, uh, one of the books being available on YouTube? Yeah, as a gift to all your listeners. The Tony Goes Shopping is available on YouTube. Just um, go into Tony Goes Shopping and it, it should come up. So YouTube search Tony YouTube, Goes Shopping yeah. and it'll be yeah. available there It's just for me reading the story, but um, you can see the pictures as well. And I know, Val, you're very kindly after offering us um, volume one and volume two of your books for two lucky winners um, for a competition that we're going to have this week. Um, I suppose... To enter the competition, it would be people could like and comment on the link for Tony the Turtle books that I will have up on the Autism uh, Journeys Facebook page, um, or equally they can like and comment on the Tony the Turtle Facebook page um, to be in with a chance to win. Is that okay with you, Val? That's great. Listen, Thanks, thank Sharon. you so so much. Um, I suppose it's time we got Tony out of his uh, uh, Tony the turtle out of his shell, really, <laughs> isn't it? It's the work in progress. Exactly. Slow and steady. Exactly. Listen, <laughs> thank you so so much, Val, for your your kind offer for the the competition and for putting this out there and helping raise awareness and getting getting people to to take note of those difficulties and making sure that kids' journeys are much, much easier. Um, you're absolutely fantastic. Thanks so, so much for coming on the show and I wish you absolutely every success for the books that you have out now and for any that you will publish in the future. Thanks a million, Sharon.
Now, following on from last week's show, when we met with Adam Harris of the charity As I Am, we asked him if he had any advice or strategies that either he or his family use and would like to share with our listeners that they might find beneficial for them. And this is what he had to say. Adam, can I ask you what age you were when you were diagnosed and what kind of strategies your parents implemented to support you when they first heard that you were diagnosed? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, I was diagnosed when I was four and a half with Asperger's syndrome. At the time, there was much less of an awareness in Ireland about what that was, what yeah. that meant. Um, it came about really from a point where, really from the day I was born, mom knew I was very different. Uh, I was born, I think, 20 days late, um, very heavy, nine and a half yeah. pounds, gained weight when I was in the hospital. And really from the moment I was born, had this huge attachment to her. So she wasn't able to put me out of her arms for even two seconds okay. without me getting very anxious, very upset and screaming the house down. But of course, when you're a young child, you, it, that's easily attributed to just a difficult baby. Yeah. Um, but I never slept in my own bed till I was seven. I didn't really sleep at all. And um, when I say that, mom was always like, I hope you tell people I tried to put you to bed. <laughs> um, but as well as that, as I began to get older, my development was very, very different. So okay. if you think about um, 18 months, um, I, by 12 months I had um, sentences yeah. but I wasn't able to crawl when I should have been able to walk Okay. so I never actually passed my 18 month checkup because my coordination and everything was so very poor um, I was very rules based in terms of everything so okay. everything relied on rules um, and I could go on and on and on but initially they had to rule a lot of things out to get to that aspect yeah. diagnosis so initially this is least very um, emotional he's very upset a lot of the time maybe he's a brain tumour and they did a lot of scans around yeah. that they ruled that out then they um, then they did uh they did hearing tests obviously they also yeah. at one stage thought that um it, it was things like uh, thinking that it was cerebral palsy because my coordination was so bad okay sit up in my buggy so it was in four and a half when they finally diagnosed me with the condition um and like a lot of parents unfortunately still my parents were trying to work out well, what does this mean now yeah. where do we go from here um at the time i suppose the first big question that they had to consider is where i would go to school because yeah. the autism classes didn't exist then so you either went to the special school far away from your home even if you had the academic ability for school. Yeah. Um, or you went to a mainstream class and you couldn't sit still in your chair, so you were just seen as a bold boy. So yeah. it was a pretty stark choice for parents to have to I make. agree. Um, in theory, I think a lot of what I got in special school then could now be catered for by a good autism class. Okay. But it's important to say a good autism class, because I think, yeah. unfortunately, at the moment, some autism classes, that means a teacher with a master's and special needs and huge experience. Yeah. And sometimes it means kind of a lava lamp in the corner. Exactly. So there is yeah. a lack of quality yeah. control sometimes. Yeah. What um, I suppose I benefited from a lot of things in terms of therapies and supports and strategies yeah. from being in special school, though. And I do always say that to families because there has, I think, at times been a, a discrediting of special education or it's nearly seen as like a, uh, a negative thing. Yeah. But I have to say that it enabled me and put me on the path that I've gone in in my yeah. life because it was being in a classroom, six children, three adults, and um, having a lot of one-to-one -one time. Great. I was, teach, you, you, I was taught using the teach method, and that was okay. very helpful for me because it's very organized, it was very structured, yeah. having my own workstation, he was hugely beneficial. One of the big things for me was I was very, very rules-based. Yeah. So I found social situations very difficult to comprehend and understand, Okay. Um, and my emotions were all over the place. So had, we did a lot of work around social stories, which okay. was that was hugely beneficial. The other thing as well that, that I do think uh, was important was by being plugged into the special school, I would have access to things like occupational yeah. therapy and counselling that were hugely important yeah. uh, when I was younger, getting them at that young age. Not counselling, sorry, um, a psychologist. Psychologist. So a psychologist used to come to the house a lot and work with my mum when I was younger. And also, I mean, I do think that there is a habit, and I think some of what we were just listening to there, I think was relevant to it, is that, yeah, I had access to these professional supports, but nothing was better than what my own mother did for me. Yeah. And a lot of that was based on instinct. Yeah. And it was very much around allowances, but also pushing boundaries yeah. quite a lot. And it was very, very much about, I had boundaries and I had rules and I had structures. And they were yeah. very strictly adhered to. So there were consequences when I did yeah. things. Because uh, I had very, very challenging behavior. Okay. On the other side of it though, there was also a very good understanding, particularly I think for it's a good while ago now of things like the sensory system and good. that was often something that I still overlooked in schools yeah. today so for example um, I, one of the things I often think about is so I, we couldn't go to restaurants when it was busy 
because the noise would all hit me at once. Yeah. If someone opened a pack of crisps in our house, the smell was too much for me and I couldn't deal with that. Um, mom, one of the things mom taught me to do that I still do today is to cancel out smells and stuff that I don't like using smells that I do like. Yeah. So for, I remember back in the day, there used to be these tubes of M&Ms you could buy that would sit yeah. on the, the shop counter. And it's a bit of a weird thing to know, but they retained the smell of M&Ms long after they were gone. So I, it's probably good I don't still do this exact thing. <laughs> I used to carry it in my pocket and open it and I'd smell it. And that nice smell would yeah. cancel out a negative smell. Good. Today, if I'm on a train, I still don't like it, but it makes it more manageable. Today, if I'm on a train, I have aftershave. And if, if someone sits down and opens it, I can put it on my sleeve. And no one knows, so I can put it on a scarf. Yeah. You can even, I bought recently, there's a website called Stimtastic, which is a really okay. recommended. It's kind of socially cool ways to stim. They have these little um, necklaces with a little vial, and there's vanilla okay. in it. And again, you can very discreetly smell it and get that relief. I suppose for you, so Adam, realistically, um, your you, the biggest help was having somebody that completely understood, understood you and your individual your individuality really. Exactly, and I think it was a journey as well, and I think that's yeah. important. So I know one of the things my mom would always talk about would be meltdowns, for example. Yeah. So back in the, well, at the start, she w- I would have had a lot of meltdowns, and she would have approached them like she would have approached a temper tantrum, or like how she would have approached um, any child being upset. Yeah. Whereas she learned with time, for example, that when I was stressed, that my mind was already overactive so I needed those she shouldn't try and reason with me then she yeah. should try and talk to me that I actually had to have a place I could go to get away I couldn't be forced into the yeah. middle of a situation um, I could, but equally and I think this is the balance I couldn't be forced into situations and I needed to have my space but equally I couldn't control the general situation so good again yeah. to come back to the crisps example when at the start m- mom wouldn't let my siblings eat them in the house Okay. by a couple of years down the road if someone was in, I had to be able to get away. Yeah. But I couldn't stop them yeah. from doing that. She so allowed you to control balanced. your own self exactly. rather than the entire sit, environment. Which is what I was doing initially. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do think that's true. The other thing that I do think is relevant in terms of a strategy, because it's the question I get asked most when I'm out and about, is that my parents also were very open from the word go in explaining to other people. Okay. And explaining to other people what they could do. Um, I know sometimes there's a fear of labeling and there's a fear of, um, of, other people's perception. Judgment, I suppose. But if suppose. you actively go out and give the right information, it can be really, really positive. Yeah. And I know even people ask me, when did you find out you had Asperger's? And it was just something we always openly talked about. Yeah. And for me, what that meant was it was always a reference point and it made me a lot more resilient to things like, say, if I was ever going to be bullied or something as yeah. I grew older as well. Adam, as a young man of 22, uh, what kind of strategy strategies do you use today that you find are beneficial and that are also socially appropriate, I suppose? Yeah, I think one of the things about it is as you get older, it's like, I sometimes use like learning to cycle a bike and after the work, the problems don't go away, exactly. but you get your balance. Yeah. And sometimes you even learn to almost subconsciously do things to better... Uh, the way someone explained to me once to create your your life and curate the things that are negative and are positive about it. I do, I do a lot of talks aimed at the 16 plus age group and that whole bit around transitioning from education to, to the adult world. I think one of the things that's kind of funny at the moment is that in the education system still, we still to a certain degree actively discourage people with autism from being themselves and regulating yeah. themselves and the things that can be so positive we discourage so a classic example is if i'm i find it very hard to sit still and yeah. if i'm sitting on a chair in my office and my mind is very busy without even realizing that i get up and i run around the room so yeah. i stim quite a lot how i sit on my office chair and your viewers won't be able to see this is i kneel with my legs underneath me yeah because that pressure helps me to sit still for longer every once in a while my legs go dead but generally it helps me to sit for longer because yeah. of that pressure now in school loads of times it's just, you can't sit like that you know that you will never get a job like that it's a negative thing the reality is i have a job and i yeah. do that and it's something that's that's very much needed yeah um the, I think we really need to much earlier on encourage people to identify ways that help them yeah. to regulate and to do that in my office if you come into it there's a trampoline in the room so yeah. if I have lots of energy I can just gently bounce on it and that will remove yeah. it. I still stim a huge amount and that's part of my day when I go between meetings and it's a positive thing because it helps me get back into the And zone. to regulate yourself and, and to be regulate ready to, to go You've into the next. You've seen before when I give talks I yeah. take my shoes off because I like the feet of the carpet underneath me yeah. and I often raise my leg so that one leg is sitting above my knee that's right um, it looks a bit like yoga um, and it's very very comfortable uh, exercise is a really big thing for me in terms yeah. of managing anxiety uh, people sometimes ask me how do you manage anxiety the answer is I don't really but it's a positive thing yeah. that I can do uh, I was mentioning earlier that one of the things I do is around smells is I can cancel out smells I like with yeah. ones I, I just like ones I like um, in terms of 
sensory on a night out I have to take sensory breaks where I come in and out of a nightclub or yeah. a bar because it helps me to to get away for, for a while and come yeah. back um, would you use things like noise cancelling headphones and I have on occasion used like for example I went to New York for work and I okay. it's not an autism crazy city, yeah. that I use the little earplugs because yeah. it just takes the edge off the sound or at yeah. Christmas um, maybe in town I would use those as well yeah. just when it's particularly packed and there's a lot going on I don't use them on a on a day to day basis yeah um, what other things do I do again another interesting thing because I think it is a strategy is how you I remember I had a brilliant resource teacher in secondary school and one of the things we discussed was um kind of uh, for a long time when I was a teenager I didn't want to talk about having autism which will come as yeah. a surprise to a lot of people because I have no problem it's with normal that. teenage behaviour yeah, yeah and I think a lot of people so coming from a family where we always talked about autism to suddenly it being the A word and it being yeah. the thing I didn't want to discuss um, uh, so I mean uh, from, from from my perspective um, one of the things that uh, I had to come to terms with was actually accepting my own diagnosis yeah. and accepting the fact that I had to do some things differently and that in itself was a big important step Um which which my resource teacher helped me to do because the night I would have actually told my friends for example that yeah. I had Asperger's would have been the night that I went on the Late Late Show um, okay. when, I was, when I was about 18 because at that stage I could even go into a room and talk about it but actually talking about it one to one was very difficult Yeah. telling my friends was such a positive experience because it means some of the things I do are better understood and it's also started a conversation I think it yeah. makes me be comfortable just being who I am the, the, how I made friends and this thing that I do think is again another strategy definitely is I was always very uh, what's that word extrovert but yeah. I wasn't very good with people my own age because I don't have a lot in common with people yeah. my own age um, but how I got more comfortable doing that was actually through interests so a big positive for me and it isn't a positive for everyone was we had a well structured transition year program in my okay. school and doing things like mini company I like projects I, I get my teeth some yeah. of those things I was getting to know people without realising I was doing it. So I was doing the project, but at the same time I was going closer to a group of friends. Good, yeah. And that was a really important turning point because what I even sometimes think now is if I was actually to stop and go through a list of my friends, really they are still actually very different from me. And yeah. how I've actually been able to get comfortable and come out going is through that shared interest yeah. and breaking down barriers that way. Good. I have to say that Adam was an absolutely capable and articulate young man. He was an absolute pleasure to, to interview and I hope to have the opportunity to interview him again in the future. Now, um, thanks again to Paul Isaacs and to Valerie Sheehan for coming on the show tonight. Um, one final piece of uh, information I suppose to share is that I'm absolutely so excited to announce that next week's guests are none other than Rosie King of the TED Talk, How Autism Freed Me to Be Myself and her mother, Sharon King. To hear them share their perspectives, tune in next time, guys, and thanks for listening.